We'll welcome everyone and please be seated. Members of the class of 2012, parents, family members, friends, faculty, and staff, welcome to today's baccalaureate ceremony. The storm clouds have gathered around us, but we have boldly decided to push forward and be outside this morning. Tomorrow looks more promising, but it is not without its risk and uncertainty. And for those of you keeping track of commencement cliches, let that be the first of what I hope are not too many. <laughs> I welcome you to the baccalaureate service <clears throat> and indeed to the entire series of events that will culminate tomorrow morning with our commencement ceremony. After tomorrow, you, our seniors, will be graduates of Washington Lee University, a distinction you will carry for the rest of your lives, lives that I am sure will be ones of consequence, full of accomplishments that will bring yet further distinction to you and to your alma mater. These are a happy few days, though strange in some ways, roller coasters of emotions, Mix, mixtures of formality, such as our gathering here this morning, and informality, such as the packing of rooms and apartments. One more tubing trip down Goshen, Scott. And maybe one last visit to Palms or McAdoo's, at least until alumni weekend this fall. There is some sadness in your leave takings and perhaps even a small tinge of anxiety as one chapter of your life reaches its conclusion and another yet to be written looms on the horizon. But let this period be enjoyable with the kind of joy and gratification that comes with knowing you have done well, that you have grown as individuals and become forever a member of this very special and extended community. There is an established rhythm to these series of events at Washington and Lee. They have changed a little over the years at least in our recent history. Tomorrow, of course, is a time of celebration for you and for your parents and family as well. Today is one of reflection and of giving thanks. Each of you knows you would not be here today without the support of family and friends, without the guidance and encouragement of your faculty, without the support of the staff, and without indeed the generations of alumni who have come before you and given of their gifts so that you might benefit from the same experience that so profoundly shaped their lives. And so we gather for this baccalaureate service. It arises from the religious traditions of the university, a university founded by disciplined, thrifty, and strong-willed Scots-Irish Presbyterians. They came to this valley in search of freedom from religious constraint and with a desire to fashion a community of hardworking individuals. From that disposition, they created a place of learning that has been non-sectarian and non-denominational. The roots of this ceremony go back to the 18th century. And as it was then, it remains a time for us to reflect on the values and foundation of this university and how an education shapes the lives of, of caring individuals. For your time here has taught you to share the fruits of your education, to take your life in a direction of service no matter your career, and to be mindful of ideals that transcend the self. We are honored and privileged to have the Reverend Dr. Christoph Keller as our baccalaureate speaker today. Chris Keller is an Episcopal priest and theologian after receiving a Bachelor of Arts from Amherst College and a Master of Divinity from the Episcopal Divinity School, he served for 16 years in parish ministry and as canon missioner of the Diocese of Arkansas. In 1991, he started St. Margaret's Church in Little Rock, initially conducting services in a bargain movie theater. In 1999, he moved with his family to New York to pursue advanced study in theology, which resulted in his receiving a Doctor of Theology degree in Anglican Studies from General Theological Seminary. His particular interests include systematic theology with a focus on theology and science. Currently, he directs the Institute for Theological Studies at St. Margaret's, 
lecturing regularly, especially on topics pertaining to religion and science. By happy coincidence, or maybe not really by coincidence, his daughter, Mary Olive, will be graduating tomorrow as a member of the class of 2012. We will hear from Reverend Keller later in the program. But I now draw your attention to the members of the Chamber Singers. After they sing The Road Home, we will welcome back Bird Datz, former coordinator of religious life, and now Catholic campus minister at St. Patrick's Church, who will lead the ceremony. And we will proceed without further interruption. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord is God. It is he that hath made us, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. 
Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. This is the day which the Lord hath made. Lift up your hearts. Let us pray. Almighty and most gracious God, we awaken to a new dawn, to a world that is charged with your grace and grandeur. We call you by many names as we gather today, members of a variety of faith traditions and yet one human family drawn together by you in love to give thanks. For the bountiful blessings of our lives and of this university, we thank you. We are grateful for the return of our families and friends who surround us with you on this wonderful day. We pause to pray in thanksgiving for all of our Washington and Lee family, for all university employees who have guided and shaped today's seniors, for the staff who cut the grass and cook the food and perform other necessary tasks, for the administrators and for the faculty who provide knowledge and inspiration. We pause in silence to honor and remember all beloved members of our families and those who have suffered the losses of loved ones during this year. May your consolation and mercy continue to reassure and comfort those who mourn. We give you thanks for the gifts that this class has provided to this community. They have delighted us with their athletic artistry and with their intellectual capacities. They have entertained us in art and song, dance and drama. They have enriched the lives of so many through their selfless hearts and voluntary actions on behalf of the needy. The nations of the world are like flowers that sprout and then wither, and all of humanity is little more than dust. Yet you never abandoned us, eternally shaping us through your loving presence, benevolent kindness, and eternal compassion. You have led us through trials, tribulations, and many tests these last four years, and bring us today to this day of sweet grace. Unite our hearts to be open to you through song and through the spoken word of our speaker, Reverend Dr. Chris Keller. Reveal to us our purpose, that our greatest success is found in service to and love of others. Keep us ever mindful that the richness of our lives is directly proportional to the quality of our relationships. We modestly and humbly implore you to provide similar weather tomorrow that we enjoy at this moment today. Finally, we ask your blessings upon these soon-to-be graduates. Be with them on mountains and in valleys, on sea and in the skies. Make safe every step they take, and with each lying down and each rising, inspire them so that their hopes may soar and their dreams take flight. In your most sacred name we pray, amen. Let us read together the word of God, which shows forth our duty, the source of our strength, and the valor of those who have laid the foundations upon which we build. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And the Lord said, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. He hath showed thee what is good. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The Lord shall preserve thee from evil. He shall preserve thy soul.
Let us now praise famous people and those that begot us. Such as did bear rule and were renowned for their power, giving counsel by their understanding. Such as sought out musical tunes and set forth verses in writing. All these were honored in their generations and were a glory in their days. And some there be which have no memorial. All will declare their wisdom. The memorial of virtue is immortal. All nations shall come and worship before the Lord. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. Sing unto God, ye kingdoms of the earth.
Her hand rested as lightly on my shoulder as it did at the Washington and Lee black and white formal. What a lovely, funny valley girl she was. Well, I'm giving everybody a chance to be seated. I'll tell you a story about my father. He was a priest and a bishop, and one time he was getting ready to get on an airplane in weather like this, and it didn't look so good, and the pilot, and the, my dad said to the pilot, well, do you think we ought to go? And he said, uh, the pilot said, well, normally, Bishop, I wouldn't, but I'm counting on you to use your influence. And my dad said, well, what influence I may have, I don't generally waste it on the weather. Why don't we just stay on the ground? <laughs> Her hand rested as lightly on my shoulder as it did at the Washington and Lee black and white formal. What a lovely, funny valley girl she was. He means a lovely, funny Shenandoah valley girl. The narrator is Dr. Thomas Moore from Love in the Ruins by Walker Percy. The novel's full title is Love in the Ruins the adventures of a bad Catholic at a time near the end. Percy's Dr. Moore is my favorite man in fiction. Early in the book, he lets the reader know that he is a direct descendant of Sir Thomas Moore, the saint, and that he shares his honors, honored namesake's faith, but there ends the resemblance. He tells us, I believe in God and the whole business. But I love women best, music and science next, whiskey next, God forth, and my fellow man hardly at all. <laughs> my habit has been to read Love in the Ruins every 20 years. The book was published in 1971 when I was in high school. I read it then on my mother's advice. This past year on third reading, I noticed that Dr. Thomas Moore was something that you in the class of 012 will be by one o'clock tomorrow afternoon, a graduate of Washington and Lee. Dr. Moore's lovely late ex-wife was a Virginian and they had met here. The marriage had been mostly happy until their daughter died and in that heartbreak they lost connection. That was also when love of God and neighbor slipped down his list of personal priorities. Reading between the lines, one suspects that booze had crept up that list higher than third place. At any time of day, a reader might find him pulling on his flask or a bottle. All of this had happened by the time the novel opens. Before he wrote the novel, Walker Percy previewed it for his good friend Shelby Foote. He said, I have in mind a futuristic novel dealing with the decline and fall of the US. The country rent almost hopelessly between the rural knothead right and the godless alienated left, worse than the Civil War. Of that and the goodness of God and of the merriness of living quite anonymously in the suburbs, drinking well, cooking out, attending mass at the usual silo and barn, the goodness of Brunswick bowling alleys, the good white maple and plastic balls, coming home of an evening with the twin rubies of the TV transmitter in the evening sky, having four drinks of good sour mash and assaulting one's wife in the armchair, chair, et cetera, what we Catholics call the sacramental life, end quote. In the novel, Dr. Moore addresses readers from a not very distant future with bad news. He is sorry to inform us that in the United States, and I quote, the center did not hold. Our beloved old USA is in a bad way. Americans have turned against each other, race against race, right against left, believer against heathen. The American experiment was failing. He wonders why. The USA didn't work. Is it even possible that from the beginning it never did work? 
that the thing always had a flaw in it, a place where it would shear. And it could be. From our founding, this has been a persistent worry. But Dr. Moore's is not a council of despair. Don't give up, he says to us. Don't give up. It's not too late. You are still the last hope. There is no one else. Bad as we are, there is no one else. You tested us, he says to God. You tested us because bad as we were, there was no one else. And everybody knew it, even our enemies. And that is why they curse us. Who curses the Chinese? Whoever imagined the Chinese were blessed by God and asked to save the world? Granted, Dr. Moore is half drunk. Granted, the view he is espousing called American exceptionalism is controversial even among Americans, considered by some to be delusional and dangerous. Granted that in some of its, its expressions, it surely is. Then we remember Abraham Lincoln and Dr. Martin Luther King. Were it not for Lincoln's insistence on American exceptionalism, this morning we would be gathered under a different flag. Had King not promised the promise, uh, not preached the promise of America as his beacon for a pre peaceful revolution, then outwardly and inwardly, we would be a very different group of people. I agree with Thomas More. This American faith that we have been blessed and called to great things has been a wellspring of national resilience and renewal. And when we forsake this faith, as our southern forebears, God forgive them, did 150 years ago, then our nation reduces down to nothing more than an ingenious design for comp managing competing interests. We have aspired to more. We are more. Don't give that up. Which brings us to this morning. In part, this occasion wants us to look forward so concerning your future, I'll say this. For our society to have raised up giants like King and Lincoln, there have had to be thousands, tens of thousands of people like them whom none of us has heard of. They were the glory of their times. Let that be you. Let that be you through the three score years or so to which you may now look forward, years for pursuing and I pray finding the merriness of living more or less anonymously in cities, suburbs, towns, for drinking well, but less, I trust, than you did here, for attending church, I hope, or synagogue, or mosque, as here you probably did not, for discovering the goodness of a bowling alley, the hard plastic ball gathering momentum down the good white maple floor, for the unscripted moment of armchair marital communion, etc., the sacramental life. God bless you looking forward. This is also a good day for looking back. And now having affirmed American exceptionalism, I ask you to consider the exceptional in your experience of Washington and Lee. This place is different too and in a way that pertains to what was said about our country's hopes and troubles. We'll begin with that connection. The novelist Marilyn Robinson has written a collection of essays under the charming title, When I Was a Child, I Read Books. This is an aside, but I'll tell you my favorite sentence in the book. The author grew up in rural Idaho and then went east to Brown University for college, and she writes, I went to college in New England, and I've lived in Massachusetts for 20 years, and I find that the hardest work in the world, in fact, it may be impossible, is to persuade Easterners that growing up in the West is not intellectually crippling. <laughs> like Walker Percy 40 years ago, Robinson loves our country and is worried for its future. She describes an ethos, hard won, that has long sustained it, sustained us, 
The worry is that we're losing it. She says, Western society at its best expresses the serene sort of courage that allows us to grant one another real safety, real autonomy, the means to think and act as judgment and conscience dictate. It assumes that this great mutual courtesy will bear its best fruit if we respect, educate, inform, and trust one another. This is the ethos that is at risk. We were centuries in building these courtesies. Without them, Western civilization would be an empty phrase. That brings us to Washington and Lee. If ever there was a college that meant to weave this deep-seated mutual courtesy into the educational fabric, it was Washington and Lee. It could so easily have been otherwise, and let us now praise R.E. Lee. Robert E. Lee's insistence here on civility and courtesy following defeat reverberated south and north and helped put this broken country back together in a decade whose troubles make ours almost vanish by comparison. Love in the ruins, that was. Now a confession, although I've already been busted, I did not attend Washington and Lee. My graduating daughter does, and my father did, but not me. Instead, I went to Amherst College. Hey, Mar Marilyn Robinson, I'll raise you a nickel. You think back east they were a little frosty about your intellectual credentials. Try going north with, hi y'all, I'm from Arkansas. <laughs> Amherst had begun as a training school for mission-minded New England frontier clergy. By my time, perhaps the one residue of that was the moral-minded faculty, especially in American studies, which was my major. Professors wanted students to leave and make America a better place for everyone. Apparently, I have absorbed their message because this morning I have repeated it to you. I've always appreciated Amherst, but something deep in my southern heart was glad when first our son chose Sewanee and then our daughter, Mary Olive, decided to come to Washington and Lee. For one thing, it occurs to me that perhaps a given name of Mary Olive might not ease a woman's way in Massachusetts. <laughs> These past four years watching from afar, it has seemed to me that this place has given you the same quality and kind of education in warm contact with the same quality and kind of teacher as I received at Amherst, but with a different underlayer. It is the old difference between Cavalier and Yankee, which was the title of a book American Studies majors read 40 years ago. We have only one rule here said President Lee to incoming students, to act like a gentleman at all times. The students knew what he meant. The Last Gentleman is the title of Walker Percy's second novel. In this book, the protagonist is a young man from Mississippi who is relocated to New York where he runs into an Alabama woman and her mother. The mother looks the young man over and the author says, she could have married him on the spot and known what she was getting. Gentle men and gentle women of the class of 012, your education has had a different flavor than would have been the case had you chosen Amherst, Brown, or Smith. A gentleman is courteous, neighborly, mannerly, and will not lie, steal, or cheat on chemistry examinations. With a gentle lady, it's the same. You did learn that here. If you trespassed that rule, you felt guilt. If another trespassed, you felt dismay. From now on, this belongs to who you are. There is more. Shelby Foote, in a letter to Walker Percy, spells out what he had always loved about the South. He said it had to do with courage, hardcore independence, and the way a rich man always had to call a poor man mister. It had to do with Southern black folk who, Foote said, stood up for a century under what would have crumpled the rest of us in a month. 
It had to do with Southern women's way of being female. Foote was writing 50 years ago. Since that time, in at least two respects, the Southern gentleman has definitely gotten better. Number one, now he does not drink and drive. And number two, now he does believe in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution. I know we all agree that those are both significant improvements in the definition of a gentleman and that the second was a long time coming. Now brace yourselves for about the next 60 seconds because for about the next 60 seconds my comments will have to do with sex. As regards the rules that govern this other important sphere of social interaction, I hope that for the past four years your more intimate involvements have been guided, protected, and perfected by commitment, fidelity, and love. Yes, I do read the Ring Tom Phi. And no, I'm not saying I believe that they always were. I am saying as a gentleman, that is how it always should be. And as a priest, I can add, it is never too late to start with commencement, a fresh beginning. Speaking of dismay, imagine my daughters that I have mentioned SEX. She knows my methods. Mary Olive and I were in the car on our way here four years ago this August. Driving along through Tennessee, I reached over and turned off whatever music source it was and said, okay, for the next one minute, the subject is sex. You do not have to talk, but you have to listen. I said my piece as she considered how bad it might hurt to jump from a car moving 70 miles per hour. <laughs> Tonight, we are having dinner in the ruins, a lovely spot on a campus so full of them. It will be a group of graduating women and their families. Something I remember from my own college graduation is a certain awkwardness concerning families. The problem is that here we parents are out of place. Yes, we are loved, but we are intruders. And especially in these final days of the life you have made together on this campus. Mom wants her hug, dad wants that picture while you glance at one another sideways, struggling to know when and how to say goodbye and not wanting to. Love in the ruins, that is. And sometimes it hurts. C.S. Lewis named four loves. Eros for romance, Philia for friendship, Storgi for love of home and family, and Agape, love divine, all loves excelling, that guides, protects, and perfects the other three. All four loves are here with us this morning but the love that has filled your hearts this final week is Storgi. For four years, it was quietly growing from that first late night trip back on Traveler. Storgi is springtime on the Maury River, sweeping up the frat house basement red-eyed on the morning after, shuffling off to class by twos and threes on a cold, rainy February morning, together dreading finals. Teams celebrating victories, teams suffering defeats, friends celebrating, sometimes suffering, fancy dress. The other loves will travel with you as you spread out across the planet, but your storgi as the class of 012 cannot leave the Shenandoah Valley. That's what hurts. Homesickness is our name for missing storgi. Come tomorrow, early Friday, you're leaving home. About nine years ago, we were sitting in the Washington and Lee admissions office. I was thumbing through the brochures and such, all laid out so neatly on the table. I noticed one titled, A Place Like No Other. It was a 2003 baccalaureate address given that year by retiring professor Thomas Litzenberg. The title implied a doctrine of Washington and Lee exceptionalism. I opened it to pass the time.
News Chopper 7. <laughs> a place like no other. I opened it to pass the time. I began to read and then, oh my goodness, I said out loud. In the second paragraph, there was a story I knew to be about my father. Professor Litzenberg wrote, some years ago, a prominent alumnus and much beloved trustee of the university was called to this podium to deliver the baccalaureate address. Elderly and weakened by illness, he hesitated before speaking. After a pause that seemed interminable, he finally began. In a halting voice that barely rose above a whisper, he said, I love this place. I wasn't here that day, but I knew the story. God, I love this place, I think is what my father said. The illness that had so weakened him was Alzheimer's disease, and it was rapidly getting worse. The fear in that long moment of hesitation for those who knew this was that his memory had failed him that he had forgotten where he was and what he had to say. When he spoke, they found out that the opposite was true. His memory had filled his heart. God, I love this place, he said. What did my father, class of 1939, love about Washington and Lee? He loved the white-columned, red-bricked, green-lawned beauty of it, without question, who would not? I know he loved the southernness, although my father was actually a Yankee, born in Michigan, raised in Montana, tell it not in Gath. He loved, yes ma'am, no sir, and okay sugar, are you ready for your check or do you want another cup of coffee? He loved this place for slowly, surely accepting change. As a trustee, he helped open Washington and Lee to women. He loved this mix of old and new, genteel, thoughtful, tradition-mindedness joined with liberal, scholarly engagement with new ideas and readiness for progress. He loved that here the center holds. He loved remembering his sweetheart, a 17-year-old Mary Baldwin freshman he'd met on a double date his senior year. What a lovely, funny Mary Baldwin girl she was. I've seen the picture. He in black tie, she in fancy dress. They had eight daughters. Three died as infants and one son. They never lost connection. At his death, they had been married more than 50 years. Of love, we are promised that it never ends. Prophecies and tongues will cease. Even knowledge, so hard won, will pass away. For our knowledge is imperfect. And when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. Childhood ends in college. So many miles from perfect. And yet still so beautiful, so memorable. So good.
be just a minute, so please stay where you are. Um, first, my thanks to Reverend Keller for a beautiful address. And, and <laughs> it's not bad for an Amherst graduate. <laughs> um, we are very, very much hoping to be outside tomorrow um, and keep Stay tuned, it does look indeed promising, so we'll do our very best. Uh, for the seniors who were, had to miss the senior class picture because of rain the other night, in five minutes, gather at the Cohen Amphitheater for um, that, that senior class picture. So just head right over there by the student commons, line up at the amphitheater, and we'll uh, take that picture for you to remember. We are adjourned. Please join us for lunch. We'll see you tomorrow.